In July 2017, we put out an episode about a case of atypical Parkinsonism, a case featuring Dr. Sneha Mantri. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for taking the call. She was a fellow in movement disorders at the time, but now is an assistant professor of neurology at Duke University and School of Medicine. Um, I miss Philadelphia. Um, But uh, getting back to atypical Parkinsonism, what exactly makes it atypical? Conditions like multiple systems atrophy, cortical basal degeneration, and progressive supranuclear palsy, not to mention several toxic states, can all mimic PD in some way. But they all have unique underlying neuropathologies, and they're all in general much less responsive to standard dopaminergic regimens. Right as that show was being published, that show that we originally produced in 2017, Wouldn't you believe it, the Movement Disorder Society endorsed PSP study group updated their clinical criteria for PSP. Now, we'll get into our case in a minute, but I want to take a second to acknowledge these revised criteria. The prior criteria for diagnosing PSP, the NINDS criteria, were incredibly specific, on the order of 95% or higher specificity, but their sensitivity was poor, an average of 24% across studies. And this can lead to a horrible delay in the diagnosis by as many as three or four years from symptom onset, which can subsequently delay timely and appropriate treatment and counseling. So better criteria were demanded, and they were developed. So I called Dr. Mantry back to chat about them. Well, I only wanted to take like five minutes of your time. Uh, Among some of the major changes in these revised criteria were the inclusion of two new functional domains, akinesia and cognitive dysfunction mostly in regard to a disturbance of speech. Um, Particularly apraxia of speech is a fairly good marker. You can sort of test for that a little bit in the, uh, just in an ordinary clinic setting by having people repeat various tongue twisters. So uh, one of my favorites is Methodist Episcopal, Methodist Episcopal, Methodist Episcopal. And as they say it over and over, they kind of are switching around phonemes or saying different uh, things and, and sort of getting it wrong, but getting it wrong in a different way each time. Methodist, specificable, Methodist, different, episcopal. And that seems like it's very tough to distinguish clinically from like a conduction aphasia. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't use that as like my my primary or my only distinguishing characteristic. Um, I guess the thing that's a little different from a conduction aphasia is that somebody with a conduction aphasia, I guess, theoretically, should be making this same or very similar mistakes every time, Mm -hmm. whereas apraxia of speech, they tend to make different mistakes every time. It's not something that I commonly see, but it's certainly something that if you see it in the right, otherwise right clinical context, certainly makes me concerned for a tauopathy. Of the updated mandatory criteria, the symptoms of PSP must be sporadic, not familial. Patients had to be 40 years of age or older, and symptoms had to be progressive, ruling out strokes and demyelination and inflammatory disorders. Then there are the exclusion criteria. There can't be any other episodic memory impairment suggestive of Alzheimer's disease. There can't be severe dysautonomia that might be suggestive of MSA. No hallucinations, which might make you think about dementia with Lewy bodies. There cannot be any genetic mimics like the C9ORF72 mutation seen in FTD. No spinocerebellar ataxia gene mutations which would be familial anyway, LARC2 or Parkin mutations, and so on and so forth. And no history of encephalitis or laboratory or radiographic evidence suggesting an alternative diagnosis like vascular dementia, prion disease, hydrocephalus, heavy metal toxicity, or any other condition. And speaking of those radiographic abnormalities in PSP, we all kind of know that hummingbird sign. And just to remember that what that's really looking at is sort of this concavity that develops on the sagittal view of the midbrain. So what I'll often do when looking, I'll I'll find the mid-sagittal cut where you can really kind of see the midbrain and the pons well, and I will draw a line across the top of the midbrain. Um, And if that midbrain is flat or kind of curving up in a convex fashion, that would be sort of a normal looking midbrain. But if it starts to sort of dip under and become concave, um, that is really what they mean by predominant midbrain atrophy. Within these basic parameters, these major inclusion and exclusion criteria, to even begin considering a diagnosis of PSP, the International Expert Panel also outlined levels of certainty based on the four major functional domains, 
And I already mentioned that they added akinesia and cognitive impairment to the previously accepted domains of postural instability and ocular motor dysfunction. So, regarding those levels of certainty, progressive gait freezing within three years, this would give you a higher certainty within the akinesia domain, while an asymmetric tremor or Parkinsonism would be a feature that gives you a lower certainty for PSP. Regarding the cognitive functional domain, a non-fluent speech pattern would also give you greater certainty for PSP. Whereas disinhibition or more significant receptive aphasia would give you less certainty, as they might be better markers for FTD or corticobasal ganglionic degeneration or something else. Anyway, there are several levels of certainty based on the symptom category, and within the various combinations of clinical features, you'll be left with four levels of complete diagnostic certainty, ranging from suggestive of PSP, which could be useful for the early identification and clinical treatment, to possible PSP. Possible and suggestive are both sort of very clinically useful, particularly you know, in terms of counseling patients and thinking about patient prognosis. All the way to definite PSP, where there is pathologic confirmation of the tauopathy. Expanding upon these definitions, and stratification based on certainty, has allowed for both earlier treatment and more targeted clinical trial enrollment for patients with probable PSP. Yeah, so I do use it mainly as a reference. So when I'm seeing somebody kind of clinically, the things that are running through my head are essentially the things that they've listed as the core clinical features. So I'm looking specifically at eye movements, um, at sort of their posture and retropulsion, bradykinesia or akinesia, um, and then the the cognitive aspect, um, particularly sort of a primary progressive aphasia type of picture. Um, either but all the small sorry. details regarding the levels of certainty, which are tied to those four core criteria, they're not practical for a general neurologist or for even a movement specialist to really know them all down to every single feature or combination. These criteria mostly serve as a reference. There's a nice table that kind of takes you through the degrees of diagnostic certainty or uncertainty. For example, considering the ocular symptoms, you can be classified as O1 if you have a vertical gaze palsy, and for the posture symptoms, you can be classified as a P1 if you've had unprovoked falls over a three-year period. Um, and I always refer back to that um, in terms of you know O1 or O2, P1, P2, and so on. And there are various combinations of these criteria, which ultimately place a patient in the category of either suggestive of PSP, possible PSP, probable PSP, or definite PSP. And so I often will tell people at diagnosis or, or early on that, you know, I think it's likely to be this, but we do have to keep in mind that there are these other syndromes that look very similar early on. And so we keep reevaluating at every visit to, to think, do we have the right diagnosis and, and how should we go about planning for the future? Okay, that was a lot to take in. Let's return to the case we originally discussed in 2017, led by Dr. Mantri, who describes the salient features of a patient who presented with atypical Parkinsonism. Here we go. Welcome back to Brainwaves. Thanks for joining us again for another great week of neurology audiocation. I'm Jim Siegler. Today we'll be discussing the case of a patient who presented with progressive falls. And presenting the case will be Dr. Mantry. I'm Sneha Mantry. I'm a fellow in movement disorders in Philadelphia. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's just get right into it. Tell us about your patient. Sure. So this is a 68-year-old gentleman um, who presented to us for evaluation of falls which had started several months before he saw us, about eight months ago, initially just kind of attributed it to tripping over things. But then when he looked after he fell, there wasn't anything on the ground. So sort of these unexplained falls. Initially, again, several months ago, was just happening when he was going downstairs, but gradually over time started to occur even on level ground. So let me jump in by saying, at this point, it would be hard to know if trouble descending stairs means that this is the story of a patient with a progressive proximal weakness pattern involving the hip girdle, as in a dermatomyositis or a limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Or it could be a story of impaired sensation or proprioception of where the feet are in space. So maybe a lower extremity polyneuropathy or radiculopathy or a posterior column process. 
or if this is a story that has something to do with more than just motor skills and coordination. Maybe the patient has trouble with down gaze, which is slow and progressive in cases of early PSP, and in rarer conditions like the adult onset Tay-Sachs and Wilson's disease, among several others. So we need to hear more about this history before we start leaning towards one condition more than another. And that's when Dr. Mantry threw in this fact. Um, And in the last six months or so before he came to see us, he also noted trouble reading the newspaper, not so much trouble reading on the computer or other things that were directly in front of him. A bit of a curveball here. Turns out the eye movements were involved. And this story is painted very perfectly for a patient who has poured down gaze. Someone who has trouble reading a book or a menu at a restaurant, for instance, but who has no trouble reading the lines on a computer screen. That's because they can look straight ahead, but the voluntary control of downward gaze, which Dr. Hamadani briefly reviewed in a prior episode on painless ophthalmoparesis, that's mediated by the vertical gaze holding centers, the rostral IMLF and the interstitial nucleus of Cajal. And I know we'll all be waiting with bated breath to hear what the exam is like, to see if our patient has a supranuclear gaze palsy, as in a vertical gaze palsy that can be overcome with the oculocephalic maneuver, which we see in early PSP and can differentiate it from a cranial neuropathy. And sometimes we also see a supranuclear gaze palsy in other causes of Parkinsonism. For now, let's just see if the patient has any other features concerning for an underlying movement or a neurodegenerative condition. Back to you, Dr. Mantry. No tremor, no double vision, no trouble swallowing. And he denied any changes in his voice, but his wife did note that his voice had been progressively softer. So, hypophonia. um, Over the last several months as well. Sometimes had to repeat, repeat himself, especially on the telephone. What do you think of when you hear a history of hypophonia? Parkinsonism. Um, And people often think hypophonia means Parkinson's disease, and that's by far the most common cause of Parkinsonism. But it can, hypophonia can occur in any Parkinsonian syndrome, um, whether idiopathic or an atypical degenerative syndrome, or even drug-induced Parkinsonism or manganism or other toxic ideologies. So uh, initially, as I mentioned, he just sort of attributed this to aging and deconditioning. Um, But last winter, he fell on the ice and broke his hip. And during that rehab process, his physical therapist pointed out to him that he had some decreased facial movement that he and his wife were sort of unaware of. Um, And that's what led to his referral to see a neurologist. And what did his neurologist do at that time? And what's kind of your initial diagnostic workup for a patient with suspected Parkinsonism. The general neurologist worked him up for neuropathy. With lab work, he was found to be slightly B12 deficient, um, but all other labs were normal. And the general neurologist had concern for Parkinson's disease, um, so started him on carbidopa, levodopa, and referred him to movement clinic. And just to give more of a background to Dr. Mantry's story, although the first-line therapy in a patient with your run-of-the-mill idiopathic Parkinson's disease, or PD, is levodopa carbidopa, you'll want to exclude other forms of secondary Parkinsonism. As in, you should be excluding things that cause Parkinsonism. These are going to be things like exposure to dopamine antagonists, like metoclopramide, chlorpromazine, and your first-generation antipsychotics. Sneha talked about this in a prior episode on drug-induced PD, so take a listen to that if you haven't already. Obviously, these medications should be stopped and switched to the less neurotoxic options. Other things to consider in this patient would be organophosphate exposure from chemical warfare or agriculture, or to heavy metals like manganese, and maybe even carbon monoxide if they had that appropriate history. And if the patient had acute onset Parkinsonism, that might make you think of a vascular radiology in addition to a drug-induced one, or it could even be an infectious process. And conversely, things like cigarette use might even lower your suspicion that the patient has PD, because for whatever insane reason, smoking cigarettes is protective. And all these things should be considered in the first evaluation of a patient with PD. But, turns out our patient didn't have any of these risk factors, so he was started on levodopa carbidopa, and then followed. Over time, by the time he came to see us, his carbidopa levodopa had been titrated up to three tablets three times a day with meals, Um, and he and his wife had not seen any improvement um, at any point over that course. 
And so what was the timeline for starting the Carpadopa Levodopa? So he'd been started on it about uh, five or six months before he came to movement clinic. Um, so he'd had a good um, trial of several months at a reasonably high dose. With no improvement. With no improvement. Okay. And this case sounds very classic for any kind of Parkinsonian syndrome. I think it's almost impossible just from the history alone to identify whether it's idiopathic PD or MSA or PSP or whatever other variant there is. Were there any other features in the history or on the review of systems that kind of guides you towards one diagnosis over the other? Yeah, absolutely. And especially when you start looking at non-motor features, they can help sort of distinguish idiopathic PD from other atypical kind of degenerative syndromes. So for instance, this patient had no issues, no lightheadedness on standing, no constipation, uh, no hyposmia or decreased sense of smell. And those are all classically seen in synucleinopathies, um, whether that's idiopathic PD or or, uh, MSA or dementia with Lewy bodies. Similarly, dream enactment behavior or REM sleep behavior disorder is commonly seen in synucleinopathies and usually actually predates the motor symptoms by several decades. So that's another way that you can help distinguish between a synucleinopathy and another atypical syndrome. And among the other non-motor symptoms, I also think about all the weird forms of dysautonomia that patients experience, and sometimes they just chalk it up to aging, but when you really get down to it on your review systems, you find that there is pretty remarkable history of it. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the one that we always think about, I think, the most and worry about the most is orthostasis because it increases people's risk of falls. Um, but any form of dysautonomia, whether it's decreased sweating or decreased heart rate variability um, or in men, erectile dysfunction um, are all very commonly seen. Um, one thing I always ask about is dry eyes and dry mouth, mostly because for many of these patients, um, because they have a decreased blink frequency, their eyes will dry out. So it's important to get them eye drops or kind of educate them on that to prevent the risk of keratitis. Dry mouth as well can be due to either mouth breathing, which can happen in MSA due to difficulty with kind of nasal breathing and nasal passages. Actually, patients with Parkinson's disease, a classic Parkinson's disease, tend to complain of drooling more than dry mouth. So it's a, another nice way to kind of distinguish between the two. Well, I think we covered a lot of the important history for our gentleman with falls. Let's move on to the exam. So his exam uh, was fairly unremarkable. General exam was notable for normal vital signs with no orthostasis on standing. Mental status exam was also normal. On cranial nerve exam, he had mild to moderate hypophonia and moderate facial masking with uh, lid retraction and a procera sign. So what are those? So lid retraction um, is where a patient appears like they're staring. They have retraction of both upper eyelids, and so they you can see the white of their eyes above the iris. It's classically seen in PSP. Similarly, a procera sign is due to contraction of the procerus muscles between the eyebrows, um, and people develop this kind of intense, terrified look. Kind of like they're bulging eyes and they're staring at you. Kind of, yeah. But also with this like very like scared facial expression. Um, it's a little difficult to describe, but once you've seen it um, or seen pictures of it, it's unforgettable, the PSP face. He had no tachyphemia, which is often seen in any Parkinsonian syndrome. Eye movements uh, were normal in the horizontal plane without nystagmus. However... On upgaze, he had restriction of voluntary upgaze with a round the house sign. What is that? So that is when a patient attempts to look up and rather than looking straight up, their eyes kind of move outwards and up. Um, so it's called round the house because they move their eyes around in order to look up because they can no longer look straight up. Also classic for PSP. Can be mistaken. I don't know about you, but I'm getting the feeling this is going to be a case of PSP. And his doll's eyes were normal in all directions, um, indicating that it's a supranuclear gaze palsy rather than a, um, something affecting the cranial nerve or the cranial nerve nucleus. He had normal horizontal saccades, uh, slightly hypometric vertical saccades. Similarly, normal horizontal OKNs, but impaired vertical OKNs in up gaze more than down gaze. 
So meaning no nystagmus was appreciated. That's right, no nystagmus. However, he did have square wave jerks. And so what does what did those mean and what would that tell you if he did have nystagmus or did have slow corrective saccades with the OKN tape? So nystagmus would sort of make me think about or point me more towards a cerebellar syndrome. Um the OKNs are often lost in progressive nuclear nuclear palsy, starting with vertical OKNs. Um, so people will have increasingly hypometric and finally absent vertical OKNs, and then they will develop hypometric and then absent horizontal OKNs. I should probably break in right here just to illustrate what Dr. Mandry means by the OKNs, or optokinetic nystagmus. To test for the optokinetic response, you can use a long red cloth that has alternating red and white stripes, or even a drum that has alternating dark and white stripes that you spin. Either way, the stripes are moved horizontally or vertically across a patient's visual field at a pretty slow rate. You should observe the slow phase or smooth pursuit of eye movements as they track the colored stripe, followed by the fast corrective saccadic movement as the patient's eyes move to the next stripe that has entered their field of vision. Under normal conditions, the eyes will saccade back to the next stripe without any difficulty. However, in conditions like PSP, the optokinetic response may be slowed in both eyes. This is not usually seen in PD, like Dr. Mantry said. And when you see an asymmetric slowing of lateral OKN response in patients, meaning one eye is slowed in its response following that OKN stripe, this should make you think of an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And square wave jerks are um, when you have the patient um, look at a relatively near target, um, such as your nose, and you can see their eyes can be mistaken for nystagmus in primary position. It's this very fast movement of the eyes back and forth as they're looking at a near target. But equal velocity in either direction, so not a fast phase, not a slow phase. That's right. Strength was normal. Um, he had mild retrocollis and axial more than appendicular rigidity, um, as well as symmetric bradykinesia. No tremor, relatively unremarkable sensory exam. Um, reflexes were normal for age. His posture was upright. Gait was very slow with decreased arm swing bilaterally, and steps were short and shuffling. No freezing, no festination, no on block turning, um, but he did retropulse spontaneously on turning and retro pulsed back into the chair after the exam. Let me ask you something about the tremor. So let me ask you something about his absence of tremor, actually. So he didn't have tremor, but you don't have to have tremor to have idiopathic PD or, or any of the other Parkinsonian syndromes. What does it mean to you that they don't have the tremor? How does that kind of affect your your conceptualization of what process he's experiencing and how does it impact your treatment? So um, that's a very good question. So you're right. Uh, you don't have to have tremor to have idiopathic PD. You just have to have bradykinesia. Now, if he had had a classic Parkinsonian tremor, that would make a diagnosis such as supranuclear palsy less likely in my mind. Um, so it's sort of supportive of this idea that he's a primarily akinetic, um, primarily axial syndrome. In an individual who did have tremor, um, say who had tremor predominant PD, there are specific medicines that I might consider using directly to target the tremor um, in addition to carbidopa levodopa for their more generalized PD symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, but it wouldn't really be applicable in a case of supranuclear palsy or an akinetic rigid PD. So would you proceed with imaging him at this point or would you just he sounds like a very classic case of PSP at the, you know right now. Would you proceed with imaging to either confirm that or to look for an alternative etiology? I often do get an MRI um, in these sort of situations just to make sure that we're not dealing with a, a secondary cause. As you said, it's a pretty classic clinical case, but just to make sure that there's not you know, an unrecognized infarct or something, which would obviously be a very different process. A DAT scan is sometimes used. I've often seen people order or consider ordering a DAT scan in this type of situation. Um, and it's important to remember that a, a DAT scan or a dopamine transporter scan does not distinguish between idiopathic PD and atypical syndromes. Um, so it's useful for distinguishing. It's indicated for distinguishing PD from essential tremor, and it can be useful in other situations as well. But it wouldn't really play a role um, in this gentleman's uh, presentation.
Assuming he has PSP, what kind of imaging features would you expect to see on the MRI? So um, the sagittal T1 tends to be your um, most highest yield sequence um, in a case like this. Uh, what you're looking for is the hummingbird sign, which is due to midbrain atrophy. So you get this kind of concave shape to the midbrain in sagittal section, um, which leads to a beaked appearance um, and and looks like a hummingbird. Um, you can also, on the um, axial sequences, see a morning glory sign, which again is due to atrophy of particularly the dorsal midbrain um, becomes more evident in the axial sections um, and you get uh, what looks like a morning glory flower or a Mickey Mouse sign is the other term for it. If it were to be another of the atypical Parkinsonian syndromes, what kinds of imaging features would you see in those cases? So for multiple systems atrophy, you would be looking for a hot cross bun sign, um, which are T2 hyperintensities in the pons. And for corticobasal syndrome, there aren't pathognomonic imaging features. Um, you can sometimes see slightly asymmetric atrophy in the parietal lobes, um, but that's not always the case. Okay. So did you get the MRI for this person? Uh, we did, and it confirmed a hummingbird sign. So what does this mean for the patient now, and how did you counsel him and his family? So it's an important distinction to make between idiopathic PD and an atypical syndrome such as PSV because the prognosis is very different. Um, and as this patient realized, um, it's less responsive to medications like Cinemet. Um, so the first step is probably to streamline their medication regimen. In his case, he was just on Cinemet, but sometimes people are on a number of different anti-Parkinsonian medications that aren't indicated in their condition. And so kind of weaning them off or titrating them off of, of unnecessary medications um, is a good first step to reduce, you know, any side effects. The other thing that's important in patients with PSP is to stay on top of things like swallowing dysfunction and uh, fall risk, um, because those are the major um, contributors to poor quality of life, as well as uh, potential contributors to death um, in patients with progressive supranuclear palsy. Um, so making sure that they see a swallow therapist they see a physical therapist regularly um, to make modifications um, and lifestyle adjustments before um, running into big problems. And lastly, a referral to palliative care or neuropalliative is always, I think, warranted in these situations to help patients and families deal with and think about end-of-life issues, um, things like advanced directives and so on, um, early in the disease course while the patient is still able to communicate their goals and wishes. And this is important because patients with PSP have poorer outcomes when compared to patients with idiopathic PD. The mean age of diagnosis for a patient of PSP is around 65, and most patients only live another 5 to 8 years. And while the main contributors to mortality are issues like impaired swallowing and falls and functional dependence, there really aren't many disease-modifying interventions we have to improve survival for these patients at this point. And because of predominantly communication difficulties and swallowing difficulties, their quality of life can be quite impaired, particularly towards the end of life. So, many of our treatment options are supportive. Things like managing their autonomic symptoms, treating the constipation, the xerostomia, xeropthalmia, orthostasis, and the percutaneous feeding. Physical therapy is also helpful for these patients. Dr. Mantry, I'm curious. Because these patients are typically unresponsive to the dopaminergic therapies, usually you won't try to escalate many pharmacologic treatments here, nor would you consider this patient for DBS, right? There isn't any evidence um, as of yet that uh, deep brain stimulation would be sort of indicated in these cases. Um, it's important to remember that DBS treats the symptoms that levodopa treats. And so in these cases, and for these patients, because they're not responsive to levodopa, there's not a clear etiologic reason why they would be responsive to DBS. Cool. Well, very interesting case. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you. Sneha Mantri, everybody. At the time this episode originally aired, 2017, 
She was a fellow in movement disorders, and now she's an assistant professor of neurology at the Parkinson Disease and Movement Disorder Center at the Duke University and School of Medicine. And since that interview, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, we have revised expert-based clinical laboratory and neuroimaging criteria for the diagnosis of PSP. The thought being that a more sensitive and specific set of criteria may lead to earlier treatment for patients who have earlier and milder symptoms of PSP. And then we'd also be left with more selective trial enrollment among those who have the highest chance of developing this neurodegenerative condition. And there are a number of various agents in preclinical trials. So hopefully with these semantic improvements, we will also see advancements in the clinical care for our patients. This episode was produced by myself, Jim Siegler, with the help of Sneha Mantri. Music was courtesy of Julie Maxwell, Jan Terrian, Josh Woodward, Quantum Jazz, and Packy Durham. I'm Jim Siegler for Brainwaves. Thanks for listening. Great. Well, thanks, Neha. All right. Yeah, no problem. Have a good day. All right. Bye-bye.